Welcome to Keeping the Spotlight on Hong Kong. Please welcome our host, Walter Lohman, Director of the Asian Studies Center at the Heritage Foundation. Hello, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. It's a very, very encouraging, impressive turnout, in fact, about 300 people online here to, to um, listen to today's program. Uh, the name of it is Keeping the Spotlight on Hong Kong because Washington, unfortunately, has a very short memory. I've been in this town longer than I like to acknowledge, um, and I've seen Washington forget and relearn many, many lessons. And on Hong Kong in particular, I've seen some ups and downs. There was a time before the umbrella movement back in 2014 when it was hard to get a quorum on Hong Kong-related issues, believe it or not. After that time, until about 2019, uh, everyone went back to sleep. And we can't let that happen again. So to help keep the focus on Hong Kong, we're honored to have an outstanding cast of speakers with us today, beginning with the former two-term governor of Florida, now Senator Rick Scott. Uh, Senator Scott is in his first term in, in the Senate, but he's already famous among the Hong Kong refugee and dissident community that's now taking shape around the world. In fact, Senator Scott got to Washington just in time. He took office in January 2019, and the upswell of public opposition to the extradition law in Hong Kong started just about two or three months later. I would say, well, and then the rest is history. It is history, but we can't let Hong Kong fade from Washington's consciousness. We have to keep fighting for our friends in Hong Kong as they fight against the communists who have taken their city. With that, let me turn the floor over to Senator Scott and let him start us off. All right. Well, first, Walter, I want to thank you for that introduction. I want to thank to the Heritage Foundation for hosting this webinar. I'm glad to be with each of you today, and I'm proud to be joined by Nathan Law, the individual I, I uh, got to invite to the State of the Union address with me, and Dennis Kwok, two great pro-democracy acti activists from Hong Kong. I think it's important for us to remember how we got here. The Chinese Communist Party, let's always remember that China is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, is led by liars, who consistently go back on the word and refuse to uphold their agreements. They signed the joint declaration with the United Kingdom in 1984, but just like every they do in every other instance of international agreements, Beijing re, is reneged on it, so, so it can, it, it's always so we can shore up power. I saw that with my own eyes in September 2019 when I had the opportunity to travel to Hong Kong to meet with business leaders, religious leaders, and pro-democracy figures. For months, Hong Kongers were organizing meetings and peacefully protesting against the Chinese Communist Party's influence in a bill that would have allowed Hong Kongers to be extradited to mainland China. If the bill had been implemented, it would have eroded the legal safeguards that distinguish Hong Kong from China. Thankfully, a few weeks before I arrived, Carrie Lam announced she was going to withdraw uh, the extradition bill. I met with Carrie Lam during my trip. Even though she had responded to the will of the Hong Kongers on that issue, it was clear even then that she's nothing but a puppet of Xi Jinping. In 2020, the National People's Congress passed the Hong Kong National Security Law, a crackdown that has destroyed freedom, assembly, and freedom of speech in Hong Kong. Since its passage, hundreds of Hong Kongers have been arrested, not for posing real threats to national security, but for standing for democracy. The Chinese government has brought baseless charges against dozens of pro-democracy activists, crushed peaceful protests, and silenced critics of the Chinese Communist Party. We can all look at just what happened to Jimmy Lai and Martin Lee. And look at what's happened to Joshua Wong. It's clear that Beijing is targeting the loudest and the strongest voices for freedom. And they are throwing them in prison to instill fear. Sadly, as if the national security law and silencing dissent wasn't enough, the Chinese Communist Party fundamentally altered Hong Kong's democratically elected legislative council. Under the new system, all candidates must be vetted and approved by the election committee of Hong Kong so that anybody who holds office in Hong Kong is simply going to be a puppet for Xi and beholden to Chinese communist ideals. Now, even if you're, willing, if you're willing to run for office, you can't unless you get the approval of the Communist Party. It's all out of salt on democracy in Hong Kong. I, don't I do think it's important to stress these abuses are, of course, not because of Carrie Lam. The silence of critics, the erosion of the rule of law, the censorship of independent news outlets, and the deprivation of basic civil liberties all come straight from one person, the, the Xi Jinping the Secretary General of the Communist Party of China. So taken office, he's had one goal, consolidate power, root out dissent. And it's time we wake up to that reality. For decades, the United States has pursued a policy of cooperation and integration. It hasn't worked. 
for years, policymakers in Washington convinced themselves that they could change communist China and could bring it to the world community. I mean, they, I mean, you have to be naive now to look back at the mistake this, uh, this was. I'm hopeful that many of our world leaders are now realizing that General Secretary Xi is not a friend. He's not a friend of anybody but himself. Intent on pursuing policies of freedom, economic cooperation and peace. He's not a friend to any of those things. He's a despot in disguise. He's masking Zhongdong with a makeover. His early lies and attempt to cover up the COVID-19 pandemic were disastrous. And every country in the world has suffered because of it. As more documents have been released about the genocide in the Uyghur homeland, we see now Xi Jinping is directly responsible for the persecution there. In January, he said the paramilitary chief had been leading the genocide to lead the Chinese military forces in Hong Kong. And now with Hong Kong's freedom activists in jail and living under the threat of government perse persecution, Xi is turning his eye towards Taiwan. Taiwan clearly can be next. For decades, communist China has threatened Taiwan, and lately has done so in word and deed. In October, nearly 150 Chinese military planes in Taiwan's air defense zone and its ground forces staged mock amphibious landings. Shortly afterwards, Xi declared that reunification with Taiwan must be fulfilled. The Chinese built, military has built a mock-up of the Taiwanese seat of government in the Chinese desert so they can practice what it would be like to take over the island. Chinese defense minister said relations with Beijing are the worst they've been in 40 years. Our own military leaders, if you listen, watch the testimony from uh, Admiral uh, Bill Davidson when he was retiring, predicted an invasion of Taiwan in the next six years. These aggressive actions from Communist China are designed to prevent the world from recognizing Taiwan as a self-governing people and intimidates partners from coming to its defense. Chinese increasingly frequent actions to harass, harass and intimidate the tiny Taiwanese people, including regularly regular military encroachments on Taiwanese islands and airspace, along with cyber attacks, should be concerning for all of the world's democracies. He's not going to stop with Taiwan. He's not going to stop with, with Hong Kong. Taiwan is one of our most important partners in the Asia Pacific. I was proud that President Biden listened after I pushed him to invite Taiwan to his democracy, uh, de de uh, December Democracy Summit. Taiwan is a robust democracy and an important partner in the fight for freedom in the, re religion, in the region. I've admired the strength of countries like Slovenia and Lithuania who have stood up to Beijing and recognized Taiwan as the self-governing nation it is. But communist China's reckless behavior means America's relationship with Taiwan is more important than ever. We must work with allies and partners to stand up for democracy, reject the appeasement of communist China, and stress that its actions in Hong Kong and Taiwan threaten American security interests and those of other democracies around the, around the world. Strong partnerships can curb communist China's Soviet-style tactics to expand communism and upend regional stability. And along with global partnerships and pressure campaigns, Congress has a role to play. What can Congress do? In 2019, I co-sponsored the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act to reevaluate Hong Kong's special trade status after Xi's takeover. Legislation President Trump signed into law. Also co-sponsored legislation that prevented American companies from exporting riot control equipment to Hong Kong police forces. The bill was also passed into law because no American company should be aiding communist China in the suppression of democracy activists. We can look at the genocide in the Uyghur homeland and recognize that under the UN uh, genocide Convention, the United States has a responsibility to punish perpetrators of genocide and use our power to prevent genocide. Recently, Congress passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which I co-sponsored, to ensure that goods coming from communist China are free from forced labor. It's terrible that it took so long and it was so hard to get done. But passing the bill is a great step to prevent Americans from being complicit in the purchase of goods made with forced labor. And, and by, by the way, you saw, you saw that... Uh, you know, the USA, Team USA uniforms made by Nike, they won't tell us where those uniforms were made. I mean, I mean they, these, these American companies, it's disgusting, their attitude. Um, similarly, the Biden administration followed my lead. After I introduced the Keep China Out of Solar Energy Act, they made, change, they made changes to solar panel imports as we learned that forced labor is often used in the solar panel production process. And after I introduced legislation, and wrote, wrote them about the issue. And to show communist China that we will not give an inch or allow them to reshape the region into, into its image, its own image, I've introduced the Taiwan Invasion Prevention Act uh, with Representative um, Guy Russian uh, Thaler. It would reaffirm America's alliance with Taiwan and end the strategic ambiguity that's been implicit in our policy. 
is an idea that Richard Haas at the Council of Foreign Relations has endorsed because we all must agree that we cannot let Communist China continue to run roughshod over those who love freedom and democracy, and they are. We've also worked with Senator Cotton and Senator Inhofe to introduce the China Trade Relations Act to strip Communist China of its permanent normal trade relations status and return it to its pre-2001 status. We've allowed Beijing to enter into World Trade Organization, and we have to hold them to account when they refuse to, they never play by the rules, and they never pursue uh, fair trade practices. We let them in, but now we've got to rein them in. With so many abuses and so much wrongdoing, we have to be comprehensive in our approach to the Chinese Communist Party. Before I conclude, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that this week, viewers around the world will watch the opening ceremony for the Winter Olympic Games. And usually we're all excited. We know the figure skaters. We know the downhill uh, 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 skiers. We know probably, if, you know, somebody's going to hopefully win a bunch of medals in, in speed skating. This year, we don't know anybody. The opening ceremony is usually a chance for Jose to allow the world to see the culture of the host country in which the games are taking place. What well, we ought to be knowing, but the culture is genocide, and that's what we should know. Uh, but they're going to try to whitewash it. They've hired lobbyists here to whitewash it. Uh, now, for two and a half weeks, the world usually stops to watch athletes from their nation compete and hope they represent their country well by bringing home the gold medal. Ideally, for a short time, our political and ge geopolitical differences uh, fade into the background as we celebrate, hopefully for all from our home states, athlete, athletic talent and our shared values, although we don't have a lot of winter athletes from Florida. Uh, but this year is different because Communist China is the host. These games are going to be used to spread Chinese propaganda and distract the world from Beijing's anti-democratic crackdowns and gross human rights abuses. I mean, it's disgusting what they do. It didn't have to be this way. I had several conversations with the International Olympic Committee about moving the games to another country that respects human rights. Of course, they're all com the IOC and their board members and their sponsors, they're all complicit. I've called on them to move the games in light of Communist China's abuses in Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xi Jinping, and the harassment of Taiwan. But they've turned a blind eye to these crimes. Now, with the opening ceremony this Friday, we all have a responsibility that we use this time, every day we can, to, to try to shed the light on exactly who the Chinese Communist Party is. This is our perfect opportunity to raise our voices in support of the Hong Kongers, freedom movers, and to stay in solidarity with those who are in jail because they use their voice to support democracy. They have shirked their responsibility to respond to these human rights abuses. The IOC has, the Biden administration has, these sponsors have, and they're helping China, communist China, China whitewash their crimes. As Americans and the greatest beacon of freedom and democracy in the world, we have to take a different path. We have to stand up day after day after day with the freedom-loving people of Hong Kong and Taiwan, the historically persecuted people of Tibet, the peaceful community of, of Uyghur Muslims, of Christians, Falun Gong, and other religious minorities, and the journalists and political distance in communist China. It was disgusting that that part owner of the, of the, uh, uh, the Warriors basketball team said he didn't care about the Uyghurs. We have to care about people all over the world. We have to stand for human rights. We stand against the political neutrality in the face of evil. Evil. If we don't, okay, we're complicit. President Biden should lead. He should lead our allies into a strategy that will meet future Chinese expansions moved in the, with joint action. We need to support our allies especially small nations like Lithuania and Slovenia. They're taking huge risk by standing up to communist China, even as larger companies like Germany and France are silent. We need some Wall Street executives. Don't worry about making more money. Worry about standing up for human rights. The NBA executives, don't worry about making more money. Stand up for human rights. American families, everyone, to ask themselves, is this the type of regime they're willing to cooperate with just to make money? We should all stop buying anything made in communist China. Communist China will not accept compromises. They demand surrender. And even as, but even as things look bleak, we should not lose hope. It took decades for the Iron Curtain to fall, but it fell. Thank God for Ronald Reagan. Things may look bleak, but the fight for freedom is never, ever, ever over. I'm proud to be the partner of Hong Kongers in Washington, and I'm 100% with you as you continue to stand against the forces of the Chinese Communist Party. I want to thank you again, Walter, for this opportunity, and I'd love to do a Q&A. Great, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate those remarks. I, pre I especially appreciate uh, the use of the words communist. You know, if, you, if you've been around Washington very long, the use of the word actually fell out of favor. You know, um, a, a Chinese official told me one time not to call him a communist. I said, but you are a communist. He said, but when you say it, it sounds like a dirty word. I said, well, that's not my fault. 
Yeah, yeah, that's your fault. You're you're the communist here. But uh, no, it's so it's so important to name things uh, what they are. And, and if one thing has happened in the last five years in Washington, it's that uh, you know we have begun to do that, and that, that's such an important thing. So, uh, Senator Scott, I'm going to turn to our panelists here and let them uh, respond to your remarks and uh, and also offer some some um, of their thoughts on 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 a couple questions, and then we'll. We've got some questions in the in the uh, chat box here. We'll, we'll pose some of those to to all of you and, and get some response. Um, first, I'm going to turn to Dennis Kwok. Um, Dennis is a, is a former LegCo member and he's a founding member of the uh, Civic Party. Uh, he's a lawyer by training. Uh, Dennis is also a part of the Asian Studies Center Advisory Council. I should I should tell you, we're very proud to have him in that role. Um, he's also now a senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center. Uh, and then I'm going to turn to Nathan Law. Nathan, who you mentioned, uh, Senator, uh, Nathan served in LegCo as well for a very brief time, and he can tell you the story. There, there is a long story behind that one. He can tell you uh, that one if he's so inclined. Uh, but Nathan has been involved in democratic activism in Hong Kong from a, from a very early age. In fact, I first met him on a visit here to Washington in his uh, capacity as co-founder of Domicisto. Uh, he and a couple of his friends um, many years ago, and that must have been as many as 10 years ago, some, some time, some time. So he's young. He's not as young as he looks, though. So uh, with that, let me, let me, uh, I wanted to turn to, um, to Dennis, get his thoughts on the, on the senator's remarks generally, but I also <laughs> wanted to ask you specifically about the state of uh, rule of law in Hong Kong, you know, through some of the darkest times uh, and we didn't know how dark they could be until the last few years. But in some of the darkest times, we always consoled ourselves. Well, it's this rule of law in Hong Kong, you know, and, and as long as that's there, we're OK. But um, there's a lot of doubt about that today. Huh? Yes, uh, Walter, um, thank you for the Heritage Foundation for organizing this talk. Indeed, we shouldn't uh, lose our uh, sight on Hong Kong. Senator, good to see you again. Nathan, good to thank see you. you. I still remember, Senator, you came out to Hong Kong in, uh, during 2019, and you and I, together with others, had um, dinner at the Council General's uh, residence uh, in Hong Kong, overlooking the beautiful skyline. Uh, unfortunately, that world seems like... Uh, is a different time uh, altogether, and uh, Hong Kong has uh, uh, officially entered uh, an authoritarian regime, or some call it a uh, uh, neo-totalitarian uh, regime. Um, which I, th I think, I think what you're looking at um, in Hong Kong is, um, of course, uh, the senator has outlined uh, all the major crackdown and major events that took place in Hong Kong in 2021, as we watched, um, and a lot of people were actually looking at uh, the end of 2021 to see if there is going to be a turnaround in policy in Hong Kong. Um, unlikely, but some were still hoping. And the reason they were looking at that is because they have completely wiped out all opposition uh, politicians in Hong Kong, either thrown them in jail or forced them to leave Hong Kong. Uh, they have completely dismantled civil society, so no, no longer any uh, candle vigil at, ten, uh, at uh, Victoria Park, and there can be no longer any groups organizing a million uh, people protests in Hong Kong. So civil society gone. Apple Daily, the number one nemesis, gone with uh, Jimmy Lai and the senior editors and journalists all in jail facing uh, um, charges that could lead up to life imprisonment under the national security law. And they have changed the rules in LegCo so that they have a patriots only uh, a legislative council without people like me and Nathan. So logic has it, they, they have locked in the complete societal and political control in Hong Kong. Surely one may reasonably ask that could, should be enough from uh, the authorities point of view to control Hong Kong. They should be now dialing back on their policy to at least pretend that uh, one country, two system, so-called one country, two system still exists uh, or try to appease the international community. None of that has happened. In fact, there are all the signs are pointing towards a continuation of that authoritarian policy and crackdown that we've seen in Hong Kong. A couple of signs, uh, Walter. Um, they are now already talking about new national security legislation that has to be passed by the Hong Kong legislature. Uh, focusing on foreign espionage, which they believe 
uh, takes place uh, rampantly in Hong Kong that they need a new law to clamp down on foreign espionage. I don't know what kind of foreign espionage they're thinking about, but this is something I think the foreign uh, or the international community needs to watch out for because I, I bet that the law they pass will have a very wide, vague definition of foreign espionage, targeting any foreigners or foreign organizations or local organizations that has a connection with a foreign organization. And that's something that you need to watch out for. I believe that what happened in 2021 is just the beginning of a complete transformation or re-engineering of Hong Kong society. What you will see is more of that but targeting different, and I predict, foreign organizations in Hong Kong. Um, and these laws, um, including amending the treason law to include foreigners, as uh, pointed out by one senior counsel uh, in Hong Kong, as one of the proposals. Uh, and as I said, foreign espionage and also a supercharged sedition law. The thing about the sedition law is, um, you asked about the rule of law, Walter. Let's compare um, Hong Kong now and Hong Kong in the darkest days of the colonial era in the 1950s. In the 1950s, uh, Tai Kung Bao, which is a pro-China uh, state-owned newspaper, published a seditious article, a so-called seditious article. It was uh, ordered to stop operation for 12 days back in 1952. Look at contrast what happened today in Hong Kong. Not that, not that they only shut down Apple Daily forever uh, and arrested the senior uh, owner and management and locked them up and charged them with a life imprisonment uh, uh, sentence that could go up to life imprisonment. Uh, and not only that, they have to stop Stan News. Uh, towards the end of the year, they arrested another digital media and completely shut it down including the directors of the media and the journalists, and charge them with sedition. So I would argue the Hong Kong today, if you're looking at the rule of law development, is worse than uh, the darkest day of the colonial era in the 1950s. This is where Hong Kong, not back in the old days, at least they would say, okay, we'll stop you for operation for 12 days, but that's it. We'll leave you to continue. But today in Hong Kong, there's no space for that. Another example is in 1962, the Chief Justice of Hong Kong actually came out and said, look, you can't arbitrarily detain people before trial. This is not part of the English legal system. We can't have that. That forced the governor back then to actually, you know, embarrass to a point where uh, they have to review the arbitrary detention be be before trial system. Look at the Hong Kong today. The arbitrary detention before trial, a lot of my colleagues are denied bail. For one year, they have almost spent in, in jail. And the Court of Final Appeal effectively endorses that system to say it's okay under the NSL. People can be locked up for a very long time uh, in uh, jail, uh, denied bail, and basically not told what they are really uh, are charged with. What are the details of the allegations which uh, you say they, they have uh, committed? What are the crimes they have actually committed? Um, no, they just thrown them in jail and then uh, they just languish in there. Uh, don't know. We still don't know when the trial will be for a lot of the major national security cases. So, um, so the rule of law is in tatters. You see the judgments coming out of Hong Kong that are um, completely devoid of human rights consideration. Which, as a lawyer, uh, as someone who's practiced there, um, that wasn't used to be the case. That human rights is uh, entrenched in the basic law used to be uh, a given serious consideration. But um, looking at many of the judgments coming out, an unauthorized peaceful un assembly, simply for attending one, you could land in jail for a year or more. I mean, that is not something that is uh, uh, in line with uh, the kind of rule of law that we are, we are seeing. And the final point is that the international businesses um, are now asking the Hong Kong government to relax the COVID regime. Uh, the quarantine regime, which is still very hard. You have to do uh, a return quarantine of 14 to 21 days, depending on where you come from. And the business are screaming and say, you can't run an international business center with uh, such a hard quarantine. Zero COVID policy doesn't work. Well, guess what? The Hong Kong government and the legislators who are newly elected will not pay any attention uh, to these uh, international business voices because they are not important anymore. Under the old Hong Kong, 
The Heritage Foundation would say it is the freest uh, economy in the world, that international businesses would love doing business there. But contrast that with what's Hong Kong uh, today. It is that international business are being driven out. And the, this COVID regime measure is really just one person deciding it is Xi Jinping deciding that um, serial COVID should be the policy we must pursue as a nation. There is no room whatsoever for Carrie Lam and the so-called new legislators in LegCo to say no. In fact, they are all outdoing each other in order to show loyalty to the regime. And each are uh, uh, showing that they are fully in support of COVID uh, serial policy when it is hurting the economy, hurting the international business. One last point is the mass exodus, um, uh, uh, Walter, that you're seeing a lot of uh, uh, Hong Kongers leaving uh, Hong Kong. In the first eight months, I think there are 90,000 people who apply for the BNO, the British National uh, Overseas Visa, to go to the UK, and that is just the UK. Every day you see um, that there, when there's a flight off to the UK, their families turn up to say goodbye to their friends. And these people are obviously not going on a short trip. Uh, when one family leaves, three fa families turn out to say goodbye. And um, as you know, Hong Kong has no natural resources. It has no industries to speak of. The Hong Kong we know, the backbone of the economy is supported by the Hong Kong people, the professionals, the medical workers, the teachers, the uh, uh, financial professionals, all of them are leaving. And that is, I think, one important data point that the international community should not um, escape. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, you know, I had a couple of things, uh, Nathan, I wanted to ask you, but uh, so much is already on the table here. Why don't I just turn it over to you and, and respond as you see fit and, and, and stress the things that you, you want to talk about? Well, yeah, thank you so much, Walter, for your invitation. And thank you so much, Senator, for your um, um, succinct um, encapsulation of the situation in Hong Kong and also um, Dennis for analysts. I think these are absolutely on point. It's really sad for us who have devoted ourselves to, to, to commit ourselves into the democratic movement and actually an enhancement, betterment of Hong Kong to see Hong Kong end up becoming an authoritarian police state. And for me, it's not just an abstract theory about democratic erosion or democratic backsliding. Uh, it's actually a lively story and I lived through that. Um, for me, I've been through the process of becoming um, a, a student leader and then becoming an elected parliamentarian, congressman, and then unseated, going to jail. And for now, I'm in exile, while many of my friends, including Joshua Wong, Benny Tai, all of them who remained in Hong Kong are in jail. And, and this is the sad reality that we are having now, especially for now, it's Lunar New Year, which uh, we celebrate with our families and our closest friends, um, whom all of those people, I am unable to see them um, anymore. I have to cut ties with them in order to protect them. Because for now, I believe uh, for myself and Dennis, probably that we are under um, the, the wanted list of the national security law, which means that if we were to be back to Hong Kong, we will also be locked up in jails for decades. Um, so this is a, a very dark time for Hong Kong. And we've got so many people leaving. And um, for now, we've got responsibility on our shoulders. Um, there had been uh, waves of immigration in, in Hong Kong um, for the past few decades. But what marks a difference in this time uh, is that most of the people who left Hong Kong now had certain political inclination. They are worried that their children getting um, brainwashed uh, about how good Communist Party is um, in school. And they're worried about these white terror, the fear of being persecuted just by chanting a slogan or supporting a uh, certain uh, political figure or opposing government's policy uh, would end up going to them. So they left Hong Kong and they showed the responsibility of rebuilding some kind of culture, preserving our identity in somewhere else, uh, most remarkably in, in the UK. So for us, uh, it's really a, a, um, a task for us to how we preserve those values, those culture that the Chinese Communist Party is determined to destroy them. For example, in Hong Kong, um, documentaries about the protest in 2019 are banned from screening. And news agencies just like Apple Daily, Stan News, Citizen News, uh, which operate to hold the government accountable or, or dare to challenge the government, are forced to disband. 
And for many other um, civil society workers and organizations, for example, organizations hosting, uh, had been hosting the Tenement Massacre candlelight vigil um, uh, every year, um, the largest uh, independent uh, union. And um, these news agencies, they are all disbanded. And the accumulation of that case of civil society in Hong Kong was crashed in just a year. So it's, it, it, it's just difficult for us to continue to see it in that way. But it also reminds everyone in the world that that is what the Chinese Communist Party is determined to do to a city once it prays as the freest city in Asia. And this is definitely a, a prototype of them that they would repeat and replicate all these strategies that they imposed in Hong Kong to the world. Because for now, the ambition of the Chinese Communist Party is just not about controlling Hong Kong, but controlling the world. They have stepped into a phase that other than just catching up the West, they have re relinquished that idea already. They are now toppling the global order, uh, the liberal order that we treasure, and building up its own alliance and its own um, order centralized in totalitarianism um, in order to destroy democracy, literally. And that's why when we talk about democratic backsliding for the past two decades, we often omit the fact that it's not only about the decline of democracy, but the rise of authoritarianism. And for now, uh, it's really good to see that we've got a shift of attitude from the US, the UK, um, the world in general. On um, We just have to be more cautious about the rise of the Chinese Communist Party and also developing mechanism to hold them accountable. We've got a change of attitude and perspective, but somehow there are still not enough mechanism or not enough um, determination to do it. So it is really a task for our for this era and for all those policymakers and and and, and politicians that we have to come up plans to try to hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable. Otherwise, what happened in Hong Kong would happen elsewhere in the world. That we've seen so many cases that people living in the U.S. that they got silenced by the Chinese Communist Party because um, they supported Hong Kong. They addressed um, the genocide in Uyghur, uh, in Uyghur population in Xinjiang. Um, but they ended up being punished by the Chinese Communist Party in an economic term or even blackmailing and intimidation. And this should not happen again. And we need support for these people that we dare to speak the truth, that we challenge, that we dare to challenge the authoritarianism or even totalitarianism. Uh, let's not forget for now, China is literally more technologically advanced than the Orwellian state depicted in 1984. They're even more savvy than them. It's really a threat to our global democracy, and it will be failed to achieve a mission of containing them, or even to a degree decoupling with them. Then we will end up losing our freedom. So this is uh, definitely the mission of our time, and I urge everyone to be part of it. We have to be guardians of our freedom and democracy, and we have to act. And Hong Kong, pay attention to it, will remind us why we have to do it and how pressing actually the situation is. And for our activists and for the politi political personnel in Hong Kong, we need your help and we need your attention. And we also need you to defend freedom with us. Wow, that was, that was, that was great from both of you. The, um, who would have guessed that 1984 would end up being an understatement for what is possible at a totalitarian state, given the technology. They, George Orwell could not conceive of the sort of technology we have today to be able to enact that nightmare. Um, you know, I, several questions have come in, all revolving around the idea of what can we do? What can governments do? And so maybe I could start with <laughs> Senator Scott. He, uh, you mentioned a couple of things in your remarks, but I wonder if you could just address like, what we can do here in Washington as a government and what we would expect of our allies and friends, like the Japanese, um, like the Australians, like the Europeans, like the, 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 the English and others. Yeah, I think first is what we should each do as an individual. I think as an individual, um, we have a responsibility uh, to step up. I, you know, I think about 
you know, when the United States was created, how a very small group of people, you know, got involved and made made big change. I think I think the big change is going to happen through individuals. So step one is why any American or any Brit or anybody in, in, that lives in democracy ever buys anything made in communist China is beyond me. So I think we've got it, and it's hard because companies like Amazon, they, they try to hide where things are produced. But what we've got to say to ourselves is we've got to figure out how never, ever, ever to buy anything produced in communist China. Because while the people of, of, of communist China might be wonderful people, the government is despicable. And ultimately, all the money goes to the government. They control all the resources, ultimately. So I think step one is, one, don't buy any, any products, don't do any services, don't travel there, um, and call them out for who they are. Uh, if you're ever talking about China, it's always communist China. Uh, and, and every time you talk about it, talk about what's happened to the Uyghurs, the, 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 the or organ harvesting, what's happened to the Tibetans. Uh, they're, you know, they're, uh, they're, uh, you know, they're stealing all of our technology. They're stealing our, 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 in, our um, personal identification. So I, <coughs> I think step one, that's what all Americans ought to be doing. Every ally, the citizens of those countries ought to be doing. Number two is what the government ought to do is show up. You know, I think government leaders have been a bunch of wimps. I think they have, um, uh, they've, they've had this idea that they're so smart they can, they can, you know, they can appease and they'll sh sh come and shine them to the right thing, or they can coerce and they'll, they're not. Don't don't buy any uh, stocks. Don't buy any bonds. Don't allow uh, Communist China to sell anything on any U.S. market. Um, don't don't. We need to stop American companies from investing uh, in uh, Communist China. They're not. It's you know. It's 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 one thing. It's one thing to say, oh, you know, we we all have freedom. We should be able to spend our money any way we want. That's absolutely true. But we shouldn't be spending our money to help somebody that wants to annihilate us. China wants to annihilate us. The Communist Party of China wants to annihilate us. So I think I think what we've got to do is don't do business, pass whatever legislation we can pass. You know, don't buy don't you know don't buy certain products if you if that's all we can get passed. But everything we can pass is let's get it done. So we know we know a lot of the the cotton is made with slave labor. So make sure you don't buy you can't buy any cotton from China. Um, call out Nike, you know for for buying. You know, it sure appears. Doesn't mean it's true. Sure appears uh, they bought these these co these uniforms uh, in Communist China. If you go, don't go to a Nike store if they're if they're going to support Communist China. Don't do business with people that support Communist China. And then call out American companies. You know, Coca Cola sits there and they want to question oh our uh, election laws in Georgia, but man, do they want to sell that Coca Cola over uh, where they're committing genocide? So call them out for it. When Delta Airlines says, oh, I'm going to call out. Uh, you know, Georgia for their election laws, which actually improve the election laws. Uh, but they are fine with, you know, flying into a communist country and wouldn't live by any of those rules. So I think I think most of it, we can pass laws and things like that. But actually, most of it is done by us as individuals. Mm -hmm. If you look at, I, I go back and think about how to, how was apartheid finally ended? It's because we d we decided that the government of South South America was, uh, was were, they're, they're horrible people, what they were doing. Uh, to to people, so we got to we got to think the same way. Yeah, that's a that's a really uh, refreshing way to look at it. In fact, I mean, there's a lot of things we can do at a government level, um, but there's individual, personal, corporate responsibility as well. You shouldn't have to tell somebody not to import slave labor made goods, right? right. <laughs> you shouldn't tell somebody they shouldn't buy. Um, goods made with slave labor, you know, so there is, a, it's a really good point to make. Um, Dennis, do you have anything on that? That is what, what others can be doing. We just have about five minutes or so here. So I want to get both you and Nathan in again here at the end to talk about this. So what, what yeah. can we do? What can our I think, allies do? I think um, uh, speaking as a lawyer and a human rights, uh, someone who's worked in the human rights field for a long time, the biggest problem that I see is that um, human rights are now trying to be, they're trying to be, uh, um, trying to make human rights to be not something universal. What I mean by that is that when we talk about human rights and rule of law principles, um, the authoritarian regimes, including China, would say, what human rights? They're not universal. They are simply a Western con construct 
that you uh, Western imperialists trying to impose on us. Surely we have our own history, we have our own culture, we have our own system that um, the human rights you talk about are, un are, are not universal. Surely we have our own human rights. But, um, you know, this kind of arguments to an untrained ear or to someone who doesn't really think about these issues sounds superficially attractive. But the moment we cave into them to say, yeah, maybe there are different sorts of human rights. Maybe our human rights are not universal. The moment we cave into that, that we have lost half more than half the battle. Because, um, you know, when the U.S. founder said that we hold these truths to be self-evident, I think those words that was said more than 200 years ago are just as important today because there are certain truths that are self-evident, that are universal, that human rights are not a Western uh, a construct, that we have to say, no, this, this is the standard that we hold everyone to. It's not about where you come from. It's not about where your background is. Um, and I think this is something that, um, uh, that everyone who cares about human rights and rule of law principles need to stand up to and not cave in on, on this uh, uh, argument. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, Nathan, uh, let me ask you that. And also, if you could address the point about um, a goal, like wh what's the reasonable outcome? Because we're, we're working for something here. What do we hope to accomplish in Hong Kong? Well, of course, the situation of Hong Kong, why it ended up to this place is because the Chinese Communist Party has so much confidence into its totalitarianism. <laughs> they disregard um, the democratic system and things that they do not have to convince um, the world that is catching up in its liberalization. So they end up making Hong Kong into an authoritarian state. And for that, we, we just have to address that problem by uh, different layers um, for the Congress. Of course, we need to pass acts to help Hong Kong people to relocate in the U.S. to help uh, to find refuge and to build up another life in order to continue to be um, speaking up against the human rights violation. And for the government, we indeed have to expand our sanction list uh, to Hong Kong officials and also corporations that are really responsible to these uh, human rights violations um, that are assisting these slave trade and all sorts of things that are doing in, 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 in um, the PRC. And also for individuals, um, we just have to keep our faith. We just have to keep engaging. We have lost the civil society in Hong Kong, but we can definitely rebuild one overseas. And at that time, government can also jam in and provide resources and platforms and necessary assistance to um, set up organizations that really help these causes. I think there are a lot to do and uh, it is not a lost lost cause. It's not a lost fight. There are still hope and ways that we can find and we can make things better. We just have to be uh, more like tenacious and more determined than ever. Great. Thank you. Um, Senator, would you like to bring us home here? Any final comments you'd like sure. to make? Well, I'm, I'm an optimist. I, I actually really do believe that we will prevail uh, because I think I think the idea that that uh, individuals have rights uh, is universal. Uh, I think it's God given, and I I do actually believe that if we are we we have to be more aggressive. We have to uh, tell our story. We have to be out there every day. I believe that that communist China will will crumble. Um, they, you know, it, it it's never ever it, it there's never a country that has been able to do this. Uh, forever. Uh, they've never been able to pull this off. They won't be able to pull this off. So what we've got to do is fight every day uh, and do everything we can to help um, the people the people in these countries that believe like we do. Uh, and then and we've got to also make sure our countries, our democracies are strong, uh, that we have uh, economically we're strong, militarily we're strong, and intellectually we're strong, i.e. that we, we actually really stand for what we say we stand for. If we do, People will continue, the, the best, the brightest will continue to flock to, to democracies around the world, and eventually uh, these totalitarian regimes will crumble. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point in the sense that uh, we spend so much time talking about the threat from China, which we should, uh, because it is a threat and across many, many different domains. We don't talk enough about its weaknesses. You know, being an authoritarian, being a totalitarian state is actually a weakness. It's a weaker form of government than a democracy. 
Uh, and there's lots of weaknesses in the economy and, and, and other things we could we could spend all day talking about. But uh, with that, let me thank you all for joining us today. Senator, it's an honor to have you. Very glad you could take the time to see us. Nathan, good to see you again. Hope to see you in Washington sometime. And, and Dennis, you're not too far away, so you should be able to get down here in the not too distant future. So thank you very much. Good to see you. Have a good day. And um, God Thanks bless you so all. much. Bye, everybody. See you. Thanks. Care. Bye. Thanks.